everybody welcome back to the cabin last week of october and we're getting the typical late uh, or mid fall weather here so it's been very damp very cold or starting to get cold very damp and very uh cloudy last few days the stream's full you might be able to hear the water in the background so this is a really important time yeah when you're homesteading when you're trying to live off the land as much as possible over the last few weeks i've been harvesting the last of the vegetables out of the gardens the potatoes the leeks and the oh what else um, you know, getting the garlic planted and things like that but also hunting some moose hunting and uh, small game hunting and really getting into deer hunting this week so this podcast upcoming podcast is quite timely so i'm talking to chris gilmore today he's 10 years younger than me but he's um, doing something quite similar with his wife uh, they're living on a small homestead actually pretty close to me here in central ontario canada and uh, he's re- very interested in land stewardship and uh, ecology forest management and homesteading skills so very similar to what i'm doing and in a very uh, similar landscape so it was interesting to talk to him and compare notes and he and his wife have some interesting ideas and they're running some interesting business in fact what i really want to share with you is their story and how they're able to make a living sort of living off the land uh, certainly avoiding traditional jobs so they're living a bit of an alternative lifestyle that's very similar to the one i'm living so i hope you enjoy this episode and then you go and check out chris and laura's um, businesses and their social media accounts just to see what they're up to i think you'll find that interesting as well so i hope you enjoy this episode and i look forward to seeing you back here at the cabin next time take care all right well tell us who you are i'm on with uh, chris gilmore but he's going to explain a little bit who, who he is and why we're talking awesome yeah so thanks for having me in here yeah my name is chris gilmore uh i run like formally is from a business perspective. I run two different projects, Chris Outdoors, uh, which is me teaching people outdoor education, uh, traditional skills, survival, hunting, things of that nature. Uh, And then uh, I also do some consulting and emergency preparedness and disaster preparedness. And then I also run uh, Wild Muskoka with my wife, Laura, who was a guest on a a past podcast there. Uh, We live on a kind of 26 acre uh, modern homestead. So we forest garden there, we have gardens, we raise rabbits and chickens. uh, And then I also hunt and fish and forage uh, both plants and mushrooms as part of our uh, sustainability journey. Uh, And I actually come from the suburbs. So my journey has really been how do you go from being a kid from the suburbs into somebody that is somewhat self-reliant? And I think that's kind of where uh, where I connected with uh, the show and your project here. What's your, if you don't mind sharing roughly your age? Uh, 43. Okay. So 10 years behind me and... um or or 10 years younger, not necessarily behind me, but 10 years younger than me, but similar journey. So you came from, so Chris and I are roughly in the same area of um, Ontario, Canada, and you're from the South, I understand, from Laura. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I was brought up in Burlington, Mm -hmm. in the suburbs. So that's basically sort of like a suburb of Toronto, I I would call it, and I grew up in a suburb of Toronto, you know, roughly 45 minutes to an hour outside of the city. So we're not... I wouldn't call us urbanites and neither one of us, I don't think grew up um, city, but suburban, you know, to what we're doing now is quite, uh, quite different. So how did you make that transition? At what age? Like when did you, when did you uh, tire of, I guess, the um, suburban or what attracted you when you were young to, to a more wild lifestyle? Yeah, I I don't, it's an interesting question, the why, you know, because I was really attracted to the outdoors from a young age. I I think there was a couple big influences and without telling my life story, you know, my parents would take us camping in the summer. Mm -hmm. Now it was nothing like my outdoors tough now, you know, it was going to drive in campgrounds with a trailer and we go for a couple days and, you know, make popcorn and s'mores and all that. So nothing like I do now, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that was an influence. Uh, I also did Boy Scouts and I had a grandma that was uh, an artist and she loved painting natural scapes. So as a young child, I would go and paint with my grandma. So I think that was kind of what instilled the roots, even though other than that, I was living a very suburban lifestyle. Um, But by my teens, I knew I wanted to get out of the city. You know, I used to dream of being a mountain man. Like I I remember watching like Jeremiah Johnson and some of those old shows as a kid. (laughs) That's what I want to be. I want to have a big beard and live in the mountains one day, you know? (laughs) So uh, when I, when I turned 19, I basically said, I'm out of here. And I, I never really went back, you know? Uh, I went off to uh, Fleming College. Uh, I studied, took the forestry program there. Uh, And then I ended up going on about a a seven, eight year journey, just kind of traveling around North America, uh, working on farms, studying wilderness survival, learning from as many people as I can. And uh, here we go. 20 years later, I'm sitting here chatting with you from our homestead. So 
I think that's interesting because that's very similar to me. I did I had the same exposures, basically. I think most Canadians did, you know, a little bit of cottage life, a little bit of like trailering or tenting, camping. Um, and I lived on the outskirts or right on the edge of a town. So I was able to walk into the neighboring township and get that outdoor experience. But to me, it kind of shows that I think it's so innate. I think we're drawn to nature and we're drawn to uh, our hands-on lifestyle and that we're kind of especially with our education system, the way it's set up, we're kind of trained to be sort of drones in the system and that we go, most of us go down that path. And then even when we do, some of us just never really give up that dream of doing that. So to me, like the wilderness family and the Jeremiah Johnson and, and the, you know, those movies were so compelling and I would go out there and kind of reenact them on my little level, you know, as a, as a young boy. And, and that never really left me, but again, I went down the traditional path as well. And then, was kind of lured back into the, or realized that, that that was unfulfilling. So we go down that path. So I'm glad to, I'm, it's interesting to hear that you have the same path, the same story. Mm -hmm. And I was always quite, you know, the other thing I should mention, I was always kind of quite rebellious towards modern society <laughs> as a youth. So I'm sure there, there was some sort of connection between that and kind of wanting to get back to my roots on the land. Yeah. So, I always thought I would go back. I didn't even get my high school diploma because I, I was lacking credits because I just had, I couldn't sit in class and think about school, but I was also so shy that I was more um, at comfortable outside and alone in the wilderness that um, I didn't fit into that classroom environment. So it, yeah, I was, I would call me rebellious too. And I've probably been seeking since then to never have a traditional job or <laughs> certainly when I did, I couldn't, uh, couldn't wait to get out of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely with you on that one. You know, I mean, I didn't, when I, I did do a handful of jobs, you know, in my early twenties, mm -hmm. But by the time I was 30, I was pretty set. Like, you know, I, I didn't want a traditional career path. Um, and I've really been working for myself since then. You know, we started Wild Muskoka, which sells the wild forage foods. And uh, I've done all kinds of different things within uh, the outdoor education world, the forestry work old world, uh, but really all on my own terms, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really been, you know, when I think about self-reliance, uh, you know, we often don't want to think about the financial side of it. You know, we often think about the dreamy part, like living in the cabin and the hunting and whatever. Mm -hmm. But money is a reality part of this world. So I do think about finances as part of my self-reliance journey as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do I financially support ourselves as part of that journey? Mm -hmm. you, you, Without having to kind of cave to that nine to five or, or working within the confounds of a system I really don't believe in. Yeah. So setting up a life that requires less money, I think is, to me, that was always the primary or not the primary, but it was one of the objectives. So I could get a life where if I can't, if I'm not making much money, then I'm resilient and I don't lose everything. But then once that foundation is set, then I can decide whether I pursue more financial means. And that to me has always been only for the support of my family. It wasn't for me personally. I'm not drawn to, to expensive things or expensive lifestyle, but getting that foundation in place first, um, to me meant having the skills and then the, some of the, the resources as a fallback. So building a cabin, my got built at my first cabin when I was, well, first cabin, non-log cabin, to just stick frame, little tiny cabin on an island was when I was 17 and then early twenties built the cabin on a property. And then I always knew that I could go out into society, act normally by society standards, but have that to go back to. So I was never going to go to zero. Absolutely. It's huge peace of mind in this world to like, know that you're not fully reliant too, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think about the number of people that uh, just hold this low level kind of chronic stress mm -hmm. because they, they recognize their dependency. And, um, you know, and, and fortunately on my journey too, you know, when I was in my early twenties, probably one of the most pivotal things in my early twenties, I actually went and spent uh, close to a year living on a cabin up in the mountains in British Columbia. I was basically house sitting for a couple of different people up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was off grid out in the middle of nowhere and really by myself for months at a time. That's cool. Uh, it was me and a dog and a couple of chickens and a couple of ducks. <laughs> Uh, and I really learned, you know, how simply I could live. And I also learned how much I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, I came, I found peace with being by myself in the woods uh, and realized how much there was to actually amuse yourself. Uh, and, and suddenly, you know, urban pursuits that cost money were a lot less interesting to me than, you know, these really potent experiences that, you know, with wild animals and, you know, crazy sunsets and hikes and viewpoints and, and even the challenges, you know, getting lost in the mountains in a snowstorm mm -hmm. and literally having to find my way out. And, mm -hmm. you know, just the richness of that was just, uh, you know, it became an obsession with me. I was like, wow, this is where life is at for me, you know, and what, what really feeds my soul. It's what I was designed to do, but it, uh, all, you know, this more raw lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. And it, to live alone like that, to think is um, like, that's a fear that a lot of people have. 
there's a fear of isolation, a fear of loneliness. And I think um, spending time alone allows you to overcome that. It's like any fear. You confront that fear and, it, and it's no longer something that scares you. So, so, but And it's a learned thing too, right? Like it was hard for me at first. And as time went gone, went on and I practiced more, I got more, much more comfortable with sure. it, you know? Yeah. And then, but that doesn't make you an introvert who's not willing to then integrate into society at some level, right? So you're married and presumably successfully married. Um, so you're, you're, and you have a business, so you're interacting with the public. So you're, yeah, it's not like, okay, you became this hermit and you're incapable of, of uh, functioning uh, community uh, wise. So that I think is interesting for people that, because I used to get this question a lot when I was <clears throat> at the beginning of this journey, spending more time uh, solo canoeing, solo canoe trips and camping trips and hunting trips. And the number one question by far I got at that time was, how do you learn to do this alone? Or how, how do you overcome that fear to do it alone? And the re answer really is to just to become proficient at something. Just, you have to do it. First of all, you get in there and get your feet wet one step at a time, but then learn the skills that give you the confidence that that bump in the night is nothing to be a scare, not, nothing to be afraid of because I know what the risks are because I've spent some time researching and gaining experience to know what the real risks are. And then, you know, trying to mitigate those as much as possible. So then you get rid of the fear aspect and now it's like, now I can enjoy this. And now I want to- The other part there, I think is the, the relationship piece too, because the fear is, you know, kind of what holds us back. But then once you get over the fear, you know, theoretically you can still get bored. Mm -hmm. But I find, you know, as you develop your your connection with the land and your relationship with the other species, you know, like when you literally start to get to know individual like groups of deer, like there's a group of deer I've been tracking for close to 15 years now. And I'll, I'll literally see the deer and be like, hey, I knew your great grandma, you know, <laughs> like to have that kind of knowledge of the wildlife and that kind of relationship, you know, yeah. suddenly that starts to fulfill that that loneliness part or, or sure. you know, those other parts sure. there because you're, you're in this really cool relationship yeah, that's, uh, with that's, the land and with the cycles, yeah. you know, and, and that's yeah. super rich. And I, I do think a lot of people are craving that and maybe have never even felt it on that like level of depth before. And it's it's. Uh, you know, as an educator, one of the things that inspires me the most is helping people have those magical mm -hmm. moments uh, that are that are nothing short of life changing, you know, and they realize how rich that deep relationship with the land can actually be. Uh, and they might not even know when they were missing it until the experience. And it, it hits people hard. And it, it's beautiful to witness. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things that actually keeps me coming back into society uh, and <laughs> wanting to teach and connect with people is, is helping other people. Oh, feel that's that. I mean, it's that's so exciting to share things but and for me it was always my family so i would go and do something and learn something and then i would like okay, bring my wife along i got to show you this this is amazing you're gonna love this and then it's the kids and then and now it's the community and now it's a global community that i get to share that with so that is exciting and then the idea of what your those relationships you're building not just with people because people think of community as the, the people around you but community is the plant community it's the wildlife community it's you know the entire ecosystem and it's the people are part of that as well. And I think, uh, I don't like the divergence that we're seeing in society where we have virtual living and then we have real living with more people choosing virtual living and losing that community um, connection at the ecological level. So that's, that's a scary thing. And they think that we are not part of nature. So they see us, people like yourself and I, as extractive rather than participatory and as um, as community members, because we're in a community and we look after that community. And your background and your passion in ecology and forest management is, uh, you know, it's it's an probably an important part of your journey. I'm assuming. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I don't maybe we talk a little bit more about um, I think e ecology because you we talked uh, briefly before about stewardship of land and and <clears throat> I'm blessed with that opportunity to have a couple of pieces of property that are sizable enough to see, well, first of all, diversity of, of ecosystems and my impact on those, but also how I'm so much more aware by being a steward of that land of how I could negatively impact it or how I could improve it. And the reality in most places in the world now is that land has been used. Almost all land has been used at some point that's habitable and it's been impacted in a lot of cases negatively. So what you're looking at is you, th you think of wilderness, a lot of times it's actually not, it's actually not the original ecosystem there and it's evolving maybe back to that state, but uh, to, 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 to participate in that process, it's kind of overwhelming on one hand, but it's enriching. 
So I don't know if you could share your experience with um, with what you're doing on your land or how or your education in that regard. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things that kind of come to mind for me. I mean, one just to build on a point you were making there about. You know, I think being brought up in the suburbs, I had this idea. So we used to come up to Algonquin Park, you know, which is the big provincial park in Ontario uh, in the summertime. And as a kid, you know, I thought, oh, you know, these vast virgin forests to the Mm -hmm. north that are like this wild natural landscape. And uh, when I went to school for forestry, I realized that these forests, you know, a lot of them are less than 100 Mm -hmm. years old. Like a lot of this area was logged to the ground in the 1800s. So what we look at today is these virgin, untouched natural forests are actually heavily influenced by humans. And that was like a big kind of like shattering of my paradigm on one thing there, you know. Um, The other part I wanted to throw in there is just this idea that uh, this is a great starting point. You know, and if you have listeners that are in a suburban place, they maybe dream of going there. They don't, you know, whether it's being more self-reliance, whether it's having the farm, whether it's living in the woods, whatever that dream is, or maybe it's even just being more prepared in an urban context. I think one foundational skill set to all of it actually is the knowledge of ecology. Uh, And that's something I'm I'm huge in promoting and something that I actually grossly underestimated in the early part of my journey. Uh, And the reason for this is, you know, uh, whether you want to build a cabin, like if you want to build a cabin, you need to know wood really, really well, you know, and not just like the names of trees, but like what are the properties of the different types of trees? Uh, Even in our wood stove, you know, I'll I'll tell a kind of a quick funny story, but uh, That's first winter that I was living by myself in the mountains. Uh, I was totally idealistic. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Uh, I'm really lucky to still be alive, honestly. (laughs) Like I did a lot of really dumb things that winter and I learned from it and I'm thankful for them. But I remember one of the first cold nights, uh, it got really cold inside the cabin and I loaded the wood stove up with cedar. And I had no idea that cedar actually burns at a different temperature than it's all the other firewoods that we had there. So literally, you know, half an hour goes by and my wood stove is glowing red. The chimney is glowing red. I came this close to burning down the cabin that night, right. you know? So when we talk about, you know, you might think, okay, well, I want to learn how I want to be a farmer or I want to live in a cabin in the woods, or I just want to be more self-sufficient. What does that have to do with knowing the burning properties of trees or the, the names of trees for that matter? Mm-hmm. You know, well, everything to do it, you know, uh, people that are, are competent in the outdoors and are self-reliant, you know, th- those little nuances of like, the, the temperature that different trees burn at is so important to efficiency on the outdoors. It's just as relevant to like, what wood do I choose to make different tools mm-hmm. out of, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the properties of those woods. The same goes with plants, you know, the same goes with getting to know wildlife. Uh, so the more that we actually understand uh, the individual species, but then also the relationship between all of these different species, mm-hmm. the better at we're going to be at wilderness survival, at log home building, at uh, emergency preparedness, the more information the land is actually giving us at any given time to help us make decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's so much value in the study of ecology. Um, so I, I really encourage people as a starting point, you know, if you're, if that feels like a big leap for you to like, you know, build that log cabin or get to the outdoors, you know, just start learning your trees, learning your plants, learning to track wildlife, because it's foundation to all of it. Um, and the third story I want to share just on that, this is when I actually realized the importance of ecology. So I was working on a permaculture farm out on the West Coast of Canada. Uh, I did a whole summer out there, spent eight months on this farm. And at that time, I was obsessed with learning how to grow food because I wanted to be more self-sufficient. And I had the realization because I did care about stewardship and the environment and the land. And that summer, I kind of had this realization, like I'm saying that I'm living on a sustainable farm, but I realized I, I don't actually know anything about the forest around me. How do I actually know this farm is sustainable if I know so little about the ecology of the habitat mm. around it? Like I don't actually have the skill set to be able to track the uh, the implications of what I'm mm-hmm. doing on the land. So that kind of became my, my first obsession in the self-reliance journey was farming mm-hmm. and growing food. And then my next obsession actually became wildlife tracking and ecology because now I want to know, well, how do I actually gauge whether I'm being sustainable mm-hmm. or not? Sustainability, organic, all these things are great buzzwords. But if you don't understand ecology, you have no way to actually ground truth whether you actually are being sustainable. Like, are you having an impact on the insect population that's then feeding into the birds, which is feeding into the wildlife, you know? Well, if you don't know which insects are there in the first place, how the heck do you know if you're having mm-hmm. an impact on them, right? Yeah, I mean, you deal with that. Once you get into this, you realize you're dealing with that on a daily basis. And what I'm discovering, and you're probably discovering as you're trying to farm or grow some food on this landscape that we're on now, compared to Southern Ontario, and Laura and I talked about this a bit, you're coming from a limestone-based deep soil ecosystem down in southwestern or southern Ontario that's uh, Great Lakes uh, based up into these uh, to this rocky 
infertile, very acid ground. And a lot of plants do just don't, can't grow. Like one of, where I have one of my gardens, it's so acidic there that literally like only things that grow are moss and you know, punch berries and, uh, and ferns. And I'm trying to grow vegetables on there, which then, okay, how much lime do I add? And is that responsible? Because that lime, lime is going through the, the soil because it's very sandy as well into the water system. And that could affect that. So I have to be very selective and isolate where I make any kind of soil improvements that benefit me and my human needs and then my human impact with what's good for the environment. So then I have to choose certain things that work better in that system. When I look around, there's blueberries, there's cranberries, there's other, there's raspberries, there's blackberries, and <clears throat> there's a few oak trees, but they're in slightly different spots. So I have to choose all these little micro ecosystems where I can say, okay, I can manipulate this for the benefit of me and wildlife in the future. But over here, I'm just fighting a losing battle. I'm actually going to burn that, burn it out, burn myself out, burn that part of the land out. Yeah. Well, you know, another thing that's really hit me, and, and I, I can't by any means pretend to be an expert on this, but I, I've been fortunate to spend some time with a, a few different First Nations communities learning. And I, a really close friend of mine, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Caleb Musgrave, he runs the Canadian Bushcraft mm -hmm. podcast. But something he's kind of brought light to me too, and this is again, a little bit kind of bursting my bubble as the naive suburban kid, is that, you know, Caleb's ancestors, the Anishinaabe people, they've been tending these forests for thousands of years. So again, we have these idea of these like virgin untouched by human forests. But the truth is that, you know, I, and again, I'm not pretending to be an expert and know the ins and outs of this, but from my understanding, a lot of forests around the world have actually been intended by indigenous peoples mm -hmm. for a long time. So humans interacting and actually changing their habit, just like beavers do in every other species, is actually normal. And, you know, we get labeled sometimes again, oh, you know, how could you be a forager and you're extracting from the natural landscape? Like, that's bad. We want to leave nature alone. Uh, and, and I think the reality is, is like, you know, no species can live on this planet without changing their habitat. All species change their habitat. So if as we develop our knowledge of ecology, what we want to do is become conscious of how we're impacting that habitat and try to do it with the other species in mind as we do it. Right. But if I live in the suburbs and pretend, oh, no, I'm hands off nature, we're not going to touch it. Well, everything about my life is just coming from ecosystems that I yeah. can't see, you know. Uh, it's funny, you know, we had somebody ripping on us uh, a couple of weeks ago on a, on a social media post about, oh, you're taking all the wildlife's food by foraging. And I thought, you know, if you go and hard, buy e even organic carrots, you know, you're buying organic carrots that were growing in a massive field. The field was once a forest that was cut down. There's no wildlife in there, minus like mm -hmm. insects and bacteria anymore to eat your organic yeah. carrots. So how is organic carrots, you know, not extractive <laughs> uh, and foraging is? Because foraging, we actually leave the mm -hmm. whole forest there. You know, all the other wildlife are still moving through there. And what we're trying to do is like, what is the fair amount for us to take and how much mm -hmm. are we leaving for the other species? And, and you know, I'm not saying I, we grow carrots, so I'm not ripping on carrots. You know, that's a conscious choice. You know, we've claimed a small amount of land that we've, we've opened up and we do grow traditional crops. Uh, but by integrating in the hunting, the fishing, the foraging pieces, I actually believe strongly that we're, we're limiting our impact on the land. Uh, and we're trying to be conscious about it. We're not being naive and saying that we don't have an impact if we just buy from the grocery store or from organic farms. Yeah, the amount of life do. that's killed in that carrot field that you're you're describing, not only was the forest cut down, all the, the uh, plants and animals that, and insects that um, required that ecosystem to live in, that, each year you're plowing, you're killing every mouse in that field. You're killing the things that come in to feed on the the, uh, the carrots and the, the carrot tops. You're feed, you're you were killing all the weeds. Like it's very, very destructive. And it's, you know, the, just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's not, it's not having an impact. And yeah, you know, can I just throw something in there that I think is super relevant to, you know, I think about how many people that are, you know, deal with like just grief and anxiety and stress and things these days. I feel like one of the biggest teachings for me in the self-reliance path too is actually taking responsibility mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. your impact on the land and seeing it, you know, whether it's I'm actually taking the life of a deer or I'm actually cutting mm -hmm. down trees. Like you're not, uh, you're actually facing all of these things head on, which are very real human things. And for me, actually doing those types of acts has helped me very much like kind of reconcile uh, just the challenges of, of being a species that has to take uh, mm -hmm. in order to survive, you know. Uh, and I, I wonder sometimes, you know, people that haven't had the ability to to kind of go through those lessons on a firsthand uh, experience, you know, does that show up in other kind of anxieties about life or, or you know, uh, crises around morals oh, and absolutely. values, you know? Uh, hunting has taught me so much about just, 
you know, reconciling life and death and, and the give and take of the natural world. You know, it's been so healthy for me to go through that. Even the passing of my own family members, uh, you know, hunting has helped me mm -hmm, reconcile true. like death. Um, you know, and I, so I think there's really, really deep lessons about life built into these mm -hmm. self-reliant skills. And if you don't experience them, it, you know, it's a hypothesis of mine that that could actually lead to like a really having a really hard mental time well, living in this that, world. Yeah. I mean, reverence for life. I, I wrote an essay actually. Well, the only project I think I actually completed in grade 11 English was a, was an essay on re the reverence for life and, and the hypocrisy against hunting and what you do learn. Like if you, if you look at, um, for example, the uh, let's look at the the uh, compost pile of the garbage, not likely compost pile, garbage of, of a typical urban resident who d has no hands-on uh, connection with their food at all, compared to somebody who harvests their food. Uh, there's very little waste when you put effort into harvesting your own food, whether you've grown it, or hunted it, or fished it, or whatever it is. You hate to see one calorie of that thing go to waste. And that life reverence, you know, I can kill a deer, I can kill a moose or a bear or a fish or whatever to eat. But, um, you know, if a bird runs into the window, like it, it has an impact on me. Like I don't want things to die or suffer unnecessarily. So I have this really, really deep respect because for one thing, I've seen that in person. I've seen things die and I've seen them die at my hands. And I don't want unnecessary suffering. So I'm going to do what I can to, to alleviate that. And I'm going to take the minimum. If you live somewhere where, or if you just don't have that connection to your food, then you don't, you tend to just throw things out. You don't finish your food. You don't um, treat it with respect. You don't, um, you don't care about the ecosystem that it came from. You don't, you don't care about that carrot field because you've never have to see that carrot field. And you don't know what's been displaced in order to grow that. Displaced in order to grow that. Yeah. And I think you're right. The, th the same still does go, even if you're having, you know, following a vegetarian lifestyle, you know, I, I think it's noble people that want to be vegetarian or vegan because they care about animals. Like I absolutely respect and understand that. But again, if you haven't gone out and grown those carrots yourself and then learned about the ecology around it, you maybe haven't had that epiphany. One, how much work goes into those carrots? Suddenly you appreciate it so much more. Suddenly you're way more conscious of the waste. But if you don't understand the ecology around the outside, you're not actually aware of like, wow, this farm, like, we're, there's actually a lot of animals not mm -hmm. living because right. of my carrots. Um, and that, that doesn't mean it's wrong. That's a part of life. It's just something that we all need mm -hmm. to reconcile in our own way, you know? Uh, so when we're removed from those substantive things, whether it's building my shelter or growing my food or collecting water, uh, I think it's really easy to kind of have naive judgments or illusions about how the world works. You know, when we do these things hands on, um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very potent. Yeah, you know? that manipulation of the land by indigenous cultures that's a real eye opener. And it's funny because the property that I'm on right now, or I'm building the cabin, uh, there's an old uh, couple of cousins, actually, they're in their mid 80s, and they've been hunting that land, the land next to it, actually, uh, crown land next to my property for 70 years. And when they started, they said they used to walk through my property to get to the camp. And they could see to the very far end of the property, they could see up on the hill if there was deer there coming down off the ridge. Today, it's a forest with 85-year-old trees on it. Like, it looks virgin. Like, if most people see me cut those massive trees down that I cut down to build a log cabin out of, they don't realize that's, they were from this generation, like, well, generation of the these old timers that's grown into what looks like a mature forest, but is very not, very not natural. That was, it's a, uh, predominance the species composition is because it is the way it is because it was cut down it was clear cut and it was actually farmed i found an old wood stove in the most remote remote part of my property that was part of a small cabin at some point you're like why would they choose this not realizing well it was field at that time this was a little lowland beside a, a low area with a little pond beside it completely different so it it's um even when you think landscape wasn't manipulated, it was. And if you look further back than that, okay, because I get this comment a lot, you know, don't touch that bear or that wolf that's circling us a couple of years ago, for example. Um, they were there before you. And reality is like uh, 10,000 years ago when the ice retreated from this region, humans and animals probably moved in at the same time, actually. And there's always been the relationship between humans and animals. Animals didn't didn't have their own little Eden and they grew and they 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 created relationships with one another without human impact. We've always pursued them. 
And when you give that example of Algonquin Park, which is one of the most heavily uh, logged or heavily managed forests in the region, the wildlife populations there that you see along the, the main highway that people drive to see the moose, and then they, they don't realize that is the most unnatural setting for, to see that animal in that's not afraid of humans and sits there and lets you take its picture or, or steps in front of a car and gets killed. They're, animals everywhere else have been pursued for as long as humans have been on this planet. And they've adapted or their behavior is actually more natural to avoid us. Um, so there's, yeah, it's, we got to stop thinking wilderness is wilderness. People are people and we should keep them separate because there is this movement in uh, society where let's just keep people in the cities and keep wilderness preserved and not, uh, not interact with it except for a few managers here and there. Uh, we need to be on the land. We need to be manipulating it to our benefit, but also the uh, wildlife's benefit to the plant community's benefit, but realize that we're part of that community and not separate from it. And it's the only way we're going to revere that life. Yeah. And that, to me, that's actually where it gets fun. You know, it's such a deep journey. Like I love, you know, one of the hats that I wear within my work is I, I do consulting for landowners uh, on how to take care of their forests, like things like permaculture. So whether it's growing food, forest gardening, growing mushrooms, uh, and just getting to know their forest. Uh, but I love helping people understand the ecology of the forest when they buy property and, you know, to even be able to like tell that story to them and then be like, hey, you know, traditionally there mm -hmm. should be way more white pines here. So why don't we actually mm -hmm. cut down some of these maple trees and you can now use that for firewood or for building and we're mm -hmm. going to plant white pine in its place. And we're going to actually increase the diversity, you know, or we're going to manage for oak for the wildlife or beech for the wildlife, you know, and, and we start actually, you know, like you called it kind of manipulating. Mm -hmm. I like to use the word we're tending the forest. Uh, and we're tending it, thinking long term for both our needs. So I can actually harvest firewood. I can cut green trees and I can build a cabin, but I can choose trees that by cutting this, I'm actually allowing more oak to come in, which now are creating the good fat and protein for the deer mm -hmm. and the turkey and the bear to get through the winter. So I think when you once you understand ecology, you realize you very much can take in a way that actually is selective mm -hmm. with what else is going to thrive. Um, so we we very much can harvest and give back to the land and. You know, on our homestead, you know, we'll always grow annual vegetables. Uh, we deal with the same challenges that you do, acidic soil, sandy soil. It's really hard to keep nutrients. Now, uh, after we've had our homestead for 13 years now, so we're definitely hitting a point where we're starting to realize that kind of what works. Uh, we are getting better at preserving the, the soil integrity um, year to year. Um, but we're also doing so much more perennial crop stuff. And I think in this landscape, perennial crops and forest gardening just makes so much sense. Uh, because, uh, you know, you're allowing the soil ecology to stay intact. You have, and, and even in a modern world where we have really busy lifestyles to grow perennial crops that actually come back year after year with very little tending, uh, it's very practical from a self-reliance perspective. So we, you know, when we first started our farm, I, I learned to grow in, on the West coast and in Southern Ontario. So I kind of imagined myself in my early twenties, one day I would have a big farm, you know, and like acres and acres of open field and gardens. And I'm actually really enjoying this pursuit of the northern growing where we have actually less than a quarter acre of uh, actual tended garden now. And on less than a quarter acre, like we grow a lot of food, like every single day of the year, we're eating stuff out of our garden. I mean, we've barely gone to the grocery store. We actually joke a little bit because when we go to the grocery store, we think that, that the clerks must think that all we eat <laughs> right. is junk food because we go to like grocery store for our treats. You know, we'll go and buy like a bag of chips and, you mm -hmm. know, kind of our like guilty pleasures. We never buy vegetables. We never buy meat. <laughs> Uh, because we're growing all that mm -hmm. and we're getting that all from the land, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but we've barely been to the grocery store since April, like hardly spent any money on groceries at all. And all winter long, we're going to be eating. That's on only a quarter acre of land. Now we do have a bunch of perennial crops that stretch beyond that into the forest that make up a chunk of our, our food there. Uh, and so in this Northern client, uh, our climate, sorry, I'm finding, you know, getting into the forest gardening and the perennial crops uh, is really making a world of difference in achieving self some degree of self and the forage them. knowledge that your wife and you, and you have right so uh, and so the, the food systems we have very again very similar paths here and to me forest gardening is the future and like i keep hearing these arguments from people saying we can't all live like that there'd be no land left but you actually i think probably we could um, you know, just again, I mean, there's economies of scale, obviously, and growing things on the prairies like grain, for example, makes sense. But you don't have to eat grain if you live here in uh, central Ontario. There's plenty of nuts, fruit, you know, wild game, fish, uh, the plants that we can grow. There's uh, 
the improvement of the land, what I'm discovering as I do these forest gardens is that the wildlife are getting half of it, which I'm totally fine with because I'm also increasing the population of the, of the wild animals, which I'm harvesting. So the apple trees that I'm putting in, the acorn, the oaks that I'm freeing up to, so that they produce acorns better. The, um, uh, so many examples of that, even the squash that uh, fed the groundhog this year instead of me. Uh, actually found a porcupine yesterday eating squash out of my garden, which I did not know they were doing. Yeah. Yeah, I kept seeing these teeth mark. I'm like, they're too too big for squirrels, or they're too small for the deer. No, there's no no deer getting into the garden. So anyway, I finally found the culprit. So anyway, all these um, a food forests allows you to integrate great food into the broader landscape for your benefit and for the animals' benefits. But I see a future for me and for my family where we get. I don't know what the percentage is going to be, but a large percentage of our food from those perennial crops. And I find that extremely exciting because I'm a lazy gardener. Like I knew that, I've known that forever. I've always grown things, as many perennials as possible or things that I could, I mulched like crazy, for example, the wood chips, even when I had a backyard garden in our old neighborhood uh, so that I didn't have to weed. I was spending half an hour, maybe a week in the garden for the majority of the growing season. So you can set up systems First of all, in the small spaces, like you're saying, a quarter of an acre, and you can also set things up so that they don't take all of your time. Because if that's one of the things that's stopping you from making the leap into this lifestyle, then, you know, gain some experience, but learn as much as you can. Take courses, whatever you have to do to learn what's necessary and try, don't do what I'm doing. Don't work harder than you need to by using hand tools most of the time or harvesting all your materials or working alone. There's way easier things to live life, ways to live life. So um, anyway, don't let that be one of the things that stops you is that you don't have access to enough land. Because the other thing I did is that I actually approached a local farmer in our old subdivision when I had real financial issues and it was 118 acres. And he said, do what you want with it. I just bought it for a future investment. And it's still sitting um, in the same state that it was 15 years ago when I did started this. And he said, you can manage it, do whatever you want with it. So 18, um, 18 acres, we had animals and, and grain crops on that. It was free, literally free, just so that it looked like it was occupied. So it helped out the landowner. So there is always ways to find a place to grow food. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people with land that like the idea of this stuff, but either don't have the time or they're getting older. So I, I think community relationships is huge in self-reliance, especially, you know, if, if buying land is a financial burden. I mean, we started out, um, we spent eight years volunteering on different farms, and that's where we basically learned the knowledge to then go do it ourselves. But there was a number of those farms that probably would have been sure. happy for us to have stayed there long term and just been workers, you know, and, and probably live very cheaply. And, mm -hmm. you know, so th those opportunities are out there. Uh, one other one I wanted to mention, that I don't know if it's on folks' radar, but I, when I think about like the food that we actually grow, probably the one crop that has made the biggest difference for us in actually uh, reaching some degree of self-reliance mm -hmm. with our food is growing mushrooms. You can grow, and, and even in an urban environment, I think people would be amazed how little work mushrooms are and how much you can grow in a small space and even how nutrient dense mushrooms are. You know, I used to not think mushrooms, like I used to think, oh, you know, the little button mushrooms in the store, they must just be kind of filler that you throw on a salad. But you know, when you start growing shiitakes and oysters, like they have protein, you know, they even have small amounts of fat, they've got vitamin A, vitamin D. So they're nutrient dense foods, but you can grow a lot in a really small space. Like we started doing shiitake logs uh, 12, sorry, 13 years ago when we bought our property. And I have wow. logs that are going on nine years of producing <laughs> shiitakes now. And I inoculated them once. Like this isn't like, you know, I plant my carrots every year. The shiitakes I planted nine years ago and all I do is harvest now. You know, once a year, maybe I'll rake the leaves around them and it takes me 20 minutes. So nine years, they fruit spring and fall, but we grow more mushrooms than we can possibly eat in a year. And, you know, we have our mushrooms over a couple of spots. You know, it's probably like a 10 by 20 area. So not a huge area. But like in an urban environment, you could literally mm -hmm. do mushroom logs on the back of a garden shed. Uh, you can grow mushrooms indoors vertically, um, like oyster mushrooms, all kinds of species. And uh, yeah, it's incredibly low work for how much you actually return from them. So I'm a huge proponent of mushrooms uh, being something you get into early in your journey of food security, just because how much they provide. And then, of course, if you layer on foraging on top of that, 
there's massive foraging potential for mushrooms as well. And we do so forage. Chris has an as online well. course, mushroom growing course. I suggest you check out. Yeah. It's funny because this morning I just answered yet another couple of questions from uh, viewers because I get this question every single day. How are your shiitake mushroom logs doing that you inoculated two years ago? And I had the first small flush from one of the logs just a couple of weeks ago, two years. No, I had some other logs that um, I had bought inoculated, pre-inoculated, and they started producing almost immediately when I got a hold of them. But these ones here, you would test your patience. And I knew when I inoculated them that they were larger logs, so it was going to take some time. But with that expectation, I'm setting the foundation. And a lot of what I do is setting the foundation for future resilience. So to know that uh, six, seven, eight, nine years, maybe I'll get production out of the, those logs is producing food for free in a shady corner by the workshop that would never grow anything else other than, well, the irony actually is that it's getting, they're getting rained on upon right now by, uh, by acorns. So I've got this food producing tree above dropping acorns onto a bunch of logs that are, that are producing mushrooms and the dead logs around it. I got, um, Lots of oysters right there and uh, some lion's mane that um, are wild. Um, so all this food, just some, this one little area in a dense forest that does not look like it would produce food for humans. So one of the things that people are struggling with, like I said, is getting into the lifestyle, but also, also so there's the financial aspect we should talk a little bit about, but the, <clears throat> it's, well, I, well, let me put it this way. So when I started off my I would say self-reliance journey in my early late teens, I guess, when I bought a piece of property and started building my first actual log cabin, I thought I could live off the land. So I moved up there when I was, I guess it was 21 in the fall, beginning of hunting seasons. And I thought, okay, I'm going to see what I can do about getting all of my calories. And this, this was extremely naive. Like I had no experience at this point, really. Um, as far as how many calories it takes to feed an individual. So I'm thinking fish and game mainly and some foraging. Well, I, if I, if I hadn't brought food, I would have starved. So basically I brought a huge bag of rice and a couple of cases of tuna, canned tuna. But that, <laughs> the amount of calories, and I've been figuring it out over the last couple of years, I, I know down to a calorie pretty much how much I can get out of each game animal or fish and I've calculated how then how much of each thing you would need. And it, it is daunting, like it's a real struggle. So when you talk about uh, living cheaply off the land, whether that's growing your own food or harvesting, foraging, uh, what does that look like for you and how much, um, <clears throat> how important would, be, would fish and game be in that? Yeah, awesome question. Um, yeah, so maybe just for, to give an overview of what we grow. So we've got our quarter acre homestead, uh, and really, you know, we grow a bunch of stuff that's fun that we eat all summer long, but there's, there's only a handful of stuff that we actually preserve and put away. And, and what we've started doing is we focus mm -hmm. more on the stuff that we can preserve and put away that actually provides calories over time, you know? So we grow a lot of squash now, uh, we grow a lot of potatoes, we grow a lot of tomatoes because we like our tomato sauces. We grow a ton of mushrooms. Uh, and then all of the other stuff. Uh, oh, and then we've gotten really into fermenting too. Uh, so we're doing like lacto fermented pickles. So I've probably got a whole winter, you know, of eating a cucumber mm -hmm. a day that's lacto fermented, which is good for your gut. Uh, mm -hmm. And then cabbages as well, very cold hardy. So those are kind of some of our staples. Carrots would be in there as well. Um, after that, we grow rabbits, incredibly efficient. Uh, and the rabbits have been huge for building soil as well. That's actually probably even a greater benefit to our farm than even the meat we get from the rabbits is the amount of manure that we get from the rabbits. And in an ecosystem where our soil gets depleted every year, it's actually, we used to, the first few years of our homestead, every year we would mm -hmm. go and buy soil from offsite and bring it in to grow our carrots, which was incredibly self-reliant, you know? And it was almost a bit of a kick. Like people come over and be like, oh, you're living the dream. You're living off the land. And we're like, well, not really. Cause we spend like a bunch of money on soil that we bring in every year. But the rabbits and the chickens have actually allowed us to close the loop on the soil, that and composting. So mm -hmm. we no longer need to bring in additional nutrients to the landscape because of our efforts now. On top of that, with the rabbits, th there's so little work. And we get a, you'd be amazed. Like, it's just me and my wife. We don't have kids. But one rabbit is four mm -hmm. meals mm -hmm. plus stock for us. And easy to process, too. Four meals too. off of one single rabbit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Super quick and easy to process, you know? Um, 
and there's good fat on them. Um, you know, when you raise, when you snare wild rabbits, mm-hmm. cause I've snared rabbits before too, they're very lean. Um, you know, so a lot of people think about, you know, uh, you hear the word like rabbit starvation or whatever, um, you know, and, and uh, wild rabbits tend to not have a lot of fat on them. Uh, farm raised rabbits are actually fairly fatty, which is really nice as well. So you are getting some good fats. Like when we make our broth, it's got a nice thick layer of good fat on it. So it, it's really good stuff. So that's kind of the food sources that we do, but the rabbits have been huge. And before I answer your question there, I am going to that. Uh, the one other thing I will say is what we've realized is we can grow a lot of rabbits in a small space. We're not going to ever grow uh, beef on our farm or, or have cows on our farm, right? In our small little woodlot. Um, we could probably do pigs. We've toyed with the idea, but like that's, um, you know, we're not really set up for it. What we've realized though, is, you know, uh, we can trade rabbits mm. with people that grow those other things. So we have a neighbor up the road that does pig and he does lamb and he does chicken. Wow. And we're now trading him rabbits for chicken. Uh, we have another friend that lives in Southern Ontario mm. that does beef and we're trading him rabbit for beef. So we're now taking the rabbit that we can grow a lot of in a very small space and bringing in other nutrients that weren't Mm. on the farm. So that's been huge in our self-reliance as well. So that's kind of like what we get from the farmstead. And then we supplement it with what we forage, what we hunt and what we fish. Now, I don't fish nearly as much as I think I should for uh, where I live. You know, I live in the land of lakes and I I, I just, I'm Mm. too busy in the summer. So I mostly Mm. only fish in the wintertime. I do a lot of ice fishing. But hunting is definitely a big part of our meal, you know. Uh, I, I aim to get a deer every year. Uh, my wife, Laura, just got her license. So hopefully we're now going to get two deers a year. Um, so we're eating venison multiple days a week all year long, you know. Uh, supplement that with some duck, some goose. And again, if you want to think sustainability, you know, there's some species that are uh, sure. declining. There's actually many species that are declining, sure. right? And, and I think that's one of the concerns sometimes people have about hunting. It's like, how can you go and hunt animals when there's species that are declining? And sh- Yes, that's true. There's a lot of things I do not advocate hunting, but there's actually a number of species that are actually growing in population, right? Canada geese would be one of those. Like there's massive flocks of Canada geese, right? There's a lot of meat on a Canada goose. Like a Canada goose goose breast is fat, you know? Again, multiple meals off a Canada goose. Yeah, for the whole goose. Plus you can make stock out of it afterwards. There is more deer where I live here than there was 150, 200 years ago on this landscape now, right? Traditionally, we're actually more in like moose and even like woodland caribou habitat, which were wiped out a long time ago. So when people are like, you know, how can you shoot deer when all these species are declining and they don't realize if you learn the history of land, there's actually more moose here than there were, or sorry, more deer now Mm -hmm. than there were a couple hundred years ago here, you know? Um, And people have been hunting deer here for the past hundred years (laughs) and there's still lots of deer here. So so clearly we've got management systems that show over a hundred year period Mm -hmm that we're not wiping out the deer by hunting them uh, here, right? So we, we were, we're basically doing that on our homestead and then we're supplementing with with hunting species, but I absolutely focus yeah. on species that are more abundant. Um, I actually stopped hunting moose locally, and this is maybe a little bit of a controversial comment. I'm not against moose hunting at all, but I do feel like where I live, the moose have actually declined over the last uh, number of years. And I made a conscious choice to stop hunting moose locally. So I would actually like to find a camp up north to go and hunt moose at where I feel good taking them. But as as I don't actually feel great about taking them here and, you know, I'm uh, to each their own, you know, I'm not against people harvest them here. I do think we can have a sustainable hunt here, but I've personally chose not to hunt moose here because I can focus on geese. Yeah, I that's ironic. Like I have a particular pocket of moose so I can walk out the door of the cabin and call a moose in almost to the porch during the rut. Yet I can't get a tag anyway because the population in the general area, as you suggested, is is declining. It's low anyway. It's pro- probably never been awesome moose habitat it, locally. Like you get pockets of really good habitat, but otherwise not the greatest. But um, I had to drive twenty hours north to shoot a bull this year with my bow. <laughs> and, and then I come home and they're like tripping all over themselves all around me. Um, but it's it's the pot. I did a. I did a video on geese actually seven years ago, maybe where I showed you yeah, again, giant Canada's were introduced like in my lifetime, reintroduced because the population had was completely decimated. So a few uh, giant Canada's were brought into Ontario and they, and they thrived. And now that's the nuisance goose that you see in all the parks and golf courses. And there are some places, the limits like 10 geese per day or 10 in, in possession. That 10 geese is actually the same weight in meat in calories as a full size deer. So it's significant. And it's a, like you said, it's an abundant species that actually needs control. 
And in a lot of cases, it can't even be hunted because it's in urban areas. So the overflow is what we're hoping to, pro to harvest. Um, but there's all kinds of examples that wild turkey was reintroduced by hunters in, in 1984 because they were eradicated from the province. And I just had a flock of five walk by me on the front porch yesterday at the cabin. And it's not, there wouldn't have been wild turkeys here ever in history. Even when they were in the province, this is not the landscape that we'd be in. They've migrated up the road systems, just walking the, the ditches, eating and, and setting up new territory. So it's sort of, yeah. That's why understanding yes. ecology and natural history is so important, though. You know, a lot of people, and, and I, I, I totally admit, I've been guilty of this multiple times, having kind of a judgment about a practice. And then when I zoom out and actually learn more about the natural history, or I learn more about ecology, mm -hmm. I realize, yeah. oh, wow, I was missing a really important yeah. part and of it's, the story and it's, and uh, in, when I made that judgment. In the past, when the indigenous cultures were using this land, it's likely that my land that I'm homesteading right now would probably have been not utilized because they had the luxury of having within limits there was conflicts everywhere just like there is today but they didn't have these ownership parcels so they were able to move with the seasons move with the game and move with the they would overuse an area and then have to move on and that that area would remain fallow for a number of generations till it grew up again because of our private ownership uh, structure now and these smaller parcels that's where this land stewardship becomes so much more essential because we can't degrade that land. We have to continue to recycle resources within that same property in order for it to not be depleted. And that's a, actually a greater struggle than maybe we've had any time in, in, in human history. So we can't just pick up and move on and we have this higher population. So we have to be more and more aware. And, uh, and I've mentioned this other times, but I, this divergence is sort of forcing a, a virtual uh, a way of living and a more urban way of living and it's separating from the people in the <clears throat> that choose this wilder lifestyle and there's a movement to tell to make people all live in cities and let's segregate from the wilderness let that go back to the way they, they perceive it always was more natural as if we were never on the landscape and i see that as just a detriment i, I just see more abuse by corporations and other entities that um don't have that connection with the land. I think we need to personally be in hands on and, and steward it properly. And every little piece of everything we do, our energy or our food or, or in our case, firewood or whatever we're using, it's like, you gotta, you, you're going to utilize it to, you, the, to the best of, <clears throat> you're going to make the most efficient use of every single piece of what you put your hands on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I have, I don't want to go down that that tangent or that rabbit hole right now, but I actually have seen some really beautiful models that are, are starting to be worked on, you know, because there are still a lot of Indigenous people that do mm -hmm. work the lands around here today, you know, not in the, the way that they used to. Uh, but I do see a push towards kind of learning from some of these ancient ways that have, have proven to be sustainable. Um, and I know I'm, I live in Williams Treaty territory, and I've been in a couple of conversations, you know, where they're trying to re-bring back kind of traditional practices of tending mm -hmm. the land. And I that that's really exciting and yeah. promising to me. So it's... it's um... I know, like you said, we probably can't go down that rabbit hole, but it's, uh, it, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of, there's a lot of obstacles and I don't, I don't, I hope we can overcome them. And I hope that there's enough people that um, want to preserve the old ways uh, from any culture that um, can, can prevail over what's happening with the world right now. And just creating resilience. I, I always say self-reliance to me is just taking more responsibility for your entire life you know your family your community everything it's to be more you know to participate more it's to be, get, be excited like you want to get up every day because you can't wait to make a positive impact on on the world or your or your family or whatever it is so um i don't know i think we i think men now more than ever we need to make that choice for ourselves and anybody i think listening to this podcast and watching the content that we're producing and going to your courses and interacting with you on a professional level are are interested and want that or are craving that that um, experience and that learning yeah and i think there's there i think there's a lot of value i touched on this earlier but even beyond the the practical part of self-reliance you know as some of these systems instructors that we have relied on we realize how fragile there are you know there's very a very practical reason to want to become more self-reliant and learn these skills uh but i, I did i do want to just say it again you know i think there is a a lot a lot of people are struggling mentally in this world and I think there's a lot of value, even if you don't ever become fully self-reliant, 
Uh, I think there's a lot of value in pursuing some of these ancient pathways to actually support your mental health and your mental well-being in this modern world. Oh, I, I, think, I think they have a lot to offer yeah, on I that know, ground that, that, as well. So to me, that's like almost primary. I think the mental health. Yeah, I, I like. I don't know. I watch my daughters and I watch people of their age starting out and they're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. They're not drawn really to anything strongly. Like they're given these manufactured choices and they're not all that appealing. And this move away from traditional family, for example, like, like mid to early to mid twenties, historically you were raising a family at that point. Now we're trying to fill that void with something else and trying to find meaning in something else. And that's a, that's a struggle. Like you're fighting biology, you're fighting evolution here. So, so there's gotta be something else that's really meaningful to replace that. And, and I'm talking, I'm just, just talking about kids. I'm talking about having a, a hands-on life and a, and a me and meaningful, um, fully participatory life where you're responsible for your food and your shelter and your warmth and all all of the things that are just, just essential to survival instead of just trying to f fill our time with things that are manufactured. Um, just, just get in there and do the thing. Just get in there and whatever, like do something, do something physical, do something for yourself, do something for your family or your community, but don't get up and just think, well, what, how am I going to fill this day? What entertainment am I going to seek? I think just get your hands dirty. I think that, that and that'll lead you down a path that I think, ends up in a meaningful life. I think we're going to have to, I think we should get together in person. We talked about this with, with uh, Laura as well. I think uh, we've, <laughs> I've talked, I mentioned before that we kind of live in the same area, but we also kind of hang around the sort of the same people in the circle of, of, uh, of uh, friends and community. So uh, we've kind of not run into each other, but I think it would be worthwhile maybe even doing a little hunt together or something, talking more about this because yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the, uh, the area that we're in. We seem to have a pretty good community people that are uh, like-minded. And I think, uh, you know, we've had a lot of people reach out to us even personally to, to get together more and, and to share our experiences and skills. And we all have, uh, different, um, different, uh, resources at, at our disposal. So I think sharing that, uh, it's a nice thing to do. So I'm glad we're in an area that, that uh, promotes that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what, um, where can people find you and what's next uh, for Chris? Sure, yeah. You, uh... Uh, well, I guess two places to find me. Um, so there's, I mentioned, so Chris Outdoors is kind of me as an educator as well as a consultant. Uh, so you can go to chrisoutdoors.ca. Uh, that's my website there. And you'll see uh, about my in-person offerings. You know, probably the best thing is just to get on the newsletter. I'm pretty good at sending out like fairly frequently, like once a month, like, educational newsletters about tracking, mm -hmm. naturalist skills. Uh, and then you'll find out about the courses that I run there. You know, everything from wildlife tracking to mushroom inoculations. Uh, I have an online mushroom growing course uh, if you're on there. Oh, you know what I thought of too? Sorry, I just want to mention quick. Uh, mm -hmm. SR30, uh, I created a coupon code this morning. So SR30, Self-Reliance 30. Uh, if anyone's interested in the mushroom course, they can go to chrisoutdoors.ca, check out the courses and go to the mushroom course. And that'll give you $30 off if you put in SR30. Uh, so that's where you can find out about me. I do have a YouTube channel, although it's nothing like yours. I'm very haphazard as, as to when I post and I haven't really been building it, but I do have some videos on there. I throw stuff up time to time. So that's the one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is Wild Muskoka Botanicals. So we do sustainably wild foraged uh, foods and drinks. So you can check out wildmuskoka.com. We also do foraging walks and mushroom walks in the Muskoka region. So you can check both of those out. Um, yeah, and as far as what's next, uh, you know, we're, we're getting the homestead ready for the, the winter time right now. You know, we've been getting our firewood stacked and um, we're uh, getting ready for the holiday season for the business. You know, we sell a lot of our forage foods mm -hmm. during the holiday season uh, and we're coming right into the prime and deer hunting season. So I'm going to be really focused on deer hunting this year uh, for the next couple of months. And then come the new year, I'm going to get back into teaching again. So uh, come January, I'm going to be running some wildlife tracking courses. And um, yeah, yeah, a number of in -person, new in-person courses are coming to the schedule in 2024. Uh, probably going to do a hunting apprenticeship next year if people are interested. So yeah, you can check some of that out. Chris Outdoors, Wild Muskoka. Great. All right. I'll put all the links in the uh, description, show notes or whatever you have on podcasts. And if you want to watch the, uh, if you want to watch the uh, uh, video um, segment, if you want to watch this on video, then head over to YouTube. It's on my Sean James channel and, I, and we'll put some content from Chris actually uh, 
in that video. So you'll get to see a little bit behind the scenes stuff as well. So I think it's valuable to go and check us out there. So I want to thank Chris for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here at the cabin next time. Yeah. I look forward to actually meeting in person next time. This was great. Great. Thanks. Thanks.